Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. The, the story I have for you today, if you took this plot outline to Hollywood and tried to sell it as a movie, they wouldn't believe it. It's too unbelievable. It's a story of heroism and greed, romance and brutality, of determination against all odds, uh, as well as deceit. And there's a little bit of sex thrown in there, too. So we're going to have a good time today. This is going to be quite a story that I'm sharing with you. A Con Conquistador's Guide to Getting Rich. You may recall that from the Maya lecture yesterday that the uh, post-classic period of the Maya ended approximately uh, 1500 A.D., so we're talking about the, the Maya civilization as, as we understand it uh, pretty much deteriorated into the small agricultural villages at that point in time. And so just approximately 21 years after the final dissolution of the, the Maya civilization, that's where our story picks up today. By the way, t keep an eye on that, that symbol. That's on the Mexican flag. I'll explain the significance of that symbol in just a few minutes. How do we know about the Aztecs? We know a lot more about the Aztecs than we know about the Maya. For one thing, uh, the Spanish conquistadores provided eyewitness accounts. Hernando Cortes and Bernal Diaz del Castillo uh, wrote up significant histories of their experiences. And also, uh, Spanish clergymen and literate Aztecs in the time period following the conquest of the Aztecs, they also describe the culture and history of the Aztecs. <clears throat> and of course, there is a, a lot of archaeological evidence as well. So we have some sources of information that were not available about the Maya. We have that information about the Aztecs. The, the term Aztec, <clears throat> first of all, they did not call themselves Aztecs. They called themselves Mexica. The X is a SH sound. And so the formation of the Mexica Empire uh, occurred beginning, the story begins in 1116 AD. By the way, that's what they called themselves, Mexicas. That's what archaeologists call them as well. But they became known as the Aztecs because their tribe originated in Aztlan, in northern Mexico. And Aztec means the people from Aztlan. In 1116 AD, that hunter-gatherer nomadic tribe began a, a quest, an exodus that took over 200 years, that took them gradually down the Mexican, uh, the country of Mexico as we see it today, into the Central Valley of Mexico. And they came upon a series of lakes <clears throat> reflected in this particular uh, map here. There were already a lot of people living in that neighborhood. Apparently it was a very desirable place, fertile ground, lots of water. And so being the newcomers in the neighborhood, they had to take up uh, residence in some of the local swamps, some of the less desirable areas. And as they were dwelling in the swamps, their priests received a vision from their supreme god, Huitzilopochtli. And that vision indicated that they were to settle on an island where there was a cactus. Perched on the cactus was an eagle eating a snake. They found that very island in Tenochtitlan, and I'll point it out on the map. It's right there. They built their home on that swampy island, called it Tenochtitlan, and as time passed, uh, they formed an alliance with Texcoco and Tlacopan, two of the, the larger tribes in that area. And then over a period of time, that alliance was very successful in subduing much of current day Mexico. The orange colored part of this map indicates the extent of the Aztec Empire. And to give you a little bit of a flavor, um, we, Puerto Chiapas is right about there. So we've been in Aztec country now for uh, a day or so. And we are sailing up the coast right here. Uh, 
And so this Triple Alliance extended its domination over much of this area. You'll notice some areas are not in orange. They continue to be independent states. For example, Tlaxcala there, and these areas as well. And that's a very important part of our story, as you'll see in just a few minutes. Yesterday, we talked about the fact that the Maya had 160 deities. The Aztecs had 1,600, 10 times as many. As much as religion um, dominated and was part of the, the Mayan life, it totally was the focus of the Aztecs. They believed that if they did not worship their gods dutifully every day, most of the day, the sun would run not rise, the crops would not grow, the rains would not fall. And consequently, they were a very, very religious people. Huitzilopochtli was their highest god of all gods, the personification of sun and war. Now, there's one other god I need to tell you about, and you'll understand why a little bit later in the uh, presentation today, Quetzalcoatl, god of the wind, also known as the winged serpent. And according to their mythology and their traditions, he was the god who gave laws and was the source of many innovations and inventions. And in the distant past, he had departed to the Eastern Sea, in other words, the Gulf of Mexico, and someday would return on a winged ship to punish bad people and help the poor and oppress. Let's remember that. We talked in the, in the lecture yesterday about the Maya, we talked about four different social classes, the ruler, nobility, peasants, and slaves. There was a, a much more uh, stratified hierarchy amongst the Aztecs, kings, nobles, priests, warriors, merchants, artisans, farmers, and slaves. This empire had 20 million people. And unlike the Maya, it was very centralized in Tenochtitlan. And consequently, their social structure was far more complex than the Maya social structure. They had been able to extend their empire over such a large area in a very short time because they were very, very successful in warfare. The purposes of warfare for them, they wanted to expand the empire and by doing so, obtain more tribute, more treasures flowing into the center to Tenochtitlan. Also, they needed captives for sacrificial as well as nutritional purposes. Human sacrifice, we talked about that with the Maya yesterday. How, when there was a, a major uh, building to be dedicated, uh, uh, someone would be sacrificed. It was reserved for very, very special occasions. The frequency and brutality of human sacrifice among the Aztecs was significantly greater than among the Maya. As many as 250,000 people a year were sacrificed in central Mexico during the 15th century equivalent to 1% of the total population and their mode of sacrifice was to open the chest and remove the beating heart of the victim. Now, I mentioned nutritional purposes as well. The Aztecs lacked domesticated animals to provide animal protein. And there are some individuals who have hyp hypothesized that the victims of human sacrifice ended up on the dinner table of the Aztecs. And there is some evidence to support that hypothesis. So uh, the diet of the Aztecs was augmented by the flesh of the sacrificial victims. They were very successful in war, not only because they were good warriors, but they had some fairly advanced weapons at that point in time, the etlatl, they didn't have a bow and arrow, but they had a dart thrower. And think of the dart as an arrow. And they could throw with great accuracy this 
dart, arrow, uh, 300 feet. And so that was a sort of a long distance weapon. The makuahuitl was their equivalent of sword. Now they did not have the use of metals. And so their sword was about three feet long and about three inches wide and was made of wood. And they would cut grooves on either side of the sword and put an adhesive in the groove and then put sharp obsidian, pieces of obsidian uh, rock in there. And it was a very, very uh, devastating weapon. The tepostopili was their spear, about the, the height of a man. And finally, of course, they had war shields. So they were a very, very successful army as they extended the conquest of the Triple Alliance across much of modern-day Mexico. But they were soon to meet another warlike tribe that would be more than their match, the conquistadors. Conquistador in Spanish means the conquerors. Now, what motivated the conquerors, the, the conquistadores, to go through great personal sacrifice and adversity to come to uh, the new world in order to, to uh, live a life of, of great hardship? Well, first of all, back home in Spain, there, there was a lot of unemployment. Many of them came from Extremadura, which is one of the poorest regions of Spain, and there was just no opportunity for advancement in that location. So they were seeking employment opportunities. Fame and higher status, many of them were minor members of nobility, and the, the only way for them to progress in the ranks of nobility would be to be successful in the new world. Religion, many of them were very, very fanatical in trying to share uh, Roman Catholicism with the, the individuals of the, of the New World. Patriotism, many of them were veterans. There had been a lot of wars on the continent and many of them had fought in those wars and they were very, very uh, capable soldiers who felt comfortable uh, going to war. But the greatest reason of all, gold fever. Hernando Cortes said, anyone who has gold can do whatever he likes, even bring souls into paradise. So gold was the ultimate motivator for all of them. I want to tell you a little bit about Hernando Cortes, a very, very unusual man. He migrated to Hispaniola at the age of 19. And then when the Spaniards populated Cuba, he went there as well. And eventually, because of his native capabilities, was able to advance to the office of mayor of Santiago, which was uh, one of the major towns in Cuba. It's sort of towards the eastern end of Cuba. And according to his personal secretary, he was ruthless, haughty, quarrelsome, and much given to women. So he was really quite a character. But apparently he caught the eye of Governor Velasquez of Cuba. And Governor Velasquez had heard rumors of a wealthy civilization in the land to the west. And so he decided to mount an expedition, a reconnaissance expedition, to f find out what truth, if, in, if any, there was to these rumors. And he selected Hernando Cortes as the leader of that expedition. And so they outfitted the ships and got ready to sail. And just before they were about to sail away, the governor decided that Hernando Cortes was not the individual who would lead that particular expedition. He lost faith in him for some reason. And so he revoked the orders for him to sail in that expedition. And Hernando Cortes sailed with 11 ships, 100 sailors, 400 soldiers, and 16 horses. He tore up the orders from Gov Governor Velasquez and weighed anchor and sailed to the west. To Cozumel, first of all, that was his first landfall. And then around the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula, over to approximately 
where modern-day Veracruz is, a major port on the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> when they arrived there at Veracruz, he announced that he was renouncing the authority of Governor Velasquez. He was going to take full command and report only to the king. Now, many of his soldiers were loyal to Governor Velasquez, and perhaps they weren't sure at all about Hernando Cortes as their leader. When he saw that they weren't following him, he burned all of the ships, destroyed any opportunity that they had to return to Cuba. The only way they would survive would be to move forward and advance into unknown territory. Now at this point in time, a very important character happened on the scene. Doña Marina had been born into a noble family in, in uh, the capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan. And for reasons that we're not sure, she was sold into slavery and became the slave of the chief of Tabasco, who had his kingdom on the, Gulf of, the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. This chief gave Doña Marina to Hernando Cortes to curry favor with him. She spoke the native language of the Aztecs, Nahuatl. In addition to the, speaking the Mayan dialects that were common along the Gulf Coast, Hernando Cortes had in his army an individual who was able to speak the Mayan dialects. So she was able to speak Nahuatl and Mayan, and so using that intermediary, the person who spoke Mayan dialect only and Spanish, that is how Hernando Cortes was able to ultimately communicate with the Aztecs when they finally reached Tenochtitlan. She became his interpreter, advisor, intermediary, mistress, and the mother of his first child. That's the sex. That's all you're going to get, folks. Sorry. <laughs> this is a G, PG rated uh, lecture. Okay. So they set off from modern day Veracruz, or that area actually. The name of it was Via Rica de la Veracruz, and set off across desolate territory, 400 miles, two mountain ranges hostile tribes. Those tribes swore that they would kill those Spaniards and eat their flesh with chili peppers. The Spaniards marched forward. They knew they couldn't turn back. Their ships were gone. They reached Tlaxcala. That was one of those independent states that had not been conquered by the Aztecs, a very warlike people. And one would think that Given the fact that they, their enemies were the Aztecs, that they would naturally want the allies, the Spaniards, to, to join up with them so that they could attack the Aztecs. Well, that was not the case at all. They attacked the Spaniards. 40,000 warriors against Cortez's 400 conquistadors. There were several bloody battles, and it was sort of a stalemate and the Tlaxcalans sent emissaries to the camp of the conquistadores and said, we see that you are hungry. It is not a noble thing to fight and kill men who are hungry, so we have brought you food. The Spaniards were very hungry. They feasted, and then they cut off the hands of all 50 emissaries and sent them back to their leaders saying, this is the kind of army that you are fighting. He then attacked a village nearby and killed all of the men, women, and children. And at that point in time, the Tlax Collins decided that, well, maybe we should ally with these individuals rather than fight them. Now, how were they able to win against such terrible odds. The weaponry was significantly more advanced than the weapons of the Telex Collins or later the Aztecs. The Spaniards had horses. Those horses were just something they had never seen before. They had armor 
to protect them from those projectiles that were thrown at them. They had small cannon called Falconet. They had a har harquebuses, which were sort of a, 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 an early version of, of muskets. And the combined impact of this kind of, of uh, weaponry was just stunning. This was an anonymous witness, uh, Indian witness, who said this. A <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> a ball of stone comes out, shooting sparks and raining fire. It makes smoke that smells of rotten mud. When the ball of stone hits a tree, the trunk splits into splinters as if it has exploded from the inside. They cover their heads and bodies with metal. Their swords are metal, their bows are metal, their shields and spears are metal. Their deer, horses, carry them on their backs, making them as tall as the roof of a house. We are powerless against them. We are nothing compared to these strangers. So they totally overwhelmed the Telex Collins. They proceeded on from Telex Kala to Tenochtitlan. It was a vision. There was no other city in the world as large and as advanced as Tenochtitlan. They had causeways that brought fresh water into the city. They had barges that removed uh, the, the sewage and, and other things like that. In fact, these poor Spaniards had never seen anything like it. And this is what one of them said. All about us, we saw cities and villages built in the water, their great towers and buildings of masonry rising out of it. When I beheld the scenes around me, I thought within myself, this was the garden of the world. To many of us, it appeared doubtful whether we were asleep or awake. Never yet did man see, hear, or dream of anything equal to our eyes this day. It was totally astounding to them. It's a very large city, 300,000 inhabitants, far larger than any city in Spain, five square miles. Place, palaces, gardens, fountains, royal zoo, a 25,000 per person market. Just the most modern city in the world at that point in time. This is what it looked like. And again, we have eyewitness accounts, so we can feel fairly certain that the architecture, the major buildings of Tenochtitlan looked like that. And the predominant building was the Temple of Huitzilopochtli. Again, a very, very religious people. Their ruler was a man by the name of Montezuma II. He was treated as a deity by his people. Rarely went out into public uh, was just wore clothes such as no one had ever seen before, <clears throat> sandals of gold. He was carried everywhere. His feet never touched the ground. He ate meals of a hundred courses. Just amazing. He was a godlike figure for them. This is the headdress that he used. We don't have very much of his personal belongings, but this particular headdress made of hundreds of Quetzal feathers is in the Hofburg Museum of Ethnology in Vienna, Austria. Just magnificent, beautiful. Well, Cortez met Montezuma. Now, remember I mentioned just a moment ago about Quetzalcoatl and how he was to return from the Eastern Sea on winged ships. The day that Cortez landed was Holy Thursday of the, which coincided was actually the day before the expected arrival of Quetzalcoatl, according to their traditions. So is it any wonder that when Montezuma met Cortez, he said, this is what our kings and those who ruled this city told us, that you would come to assume your rightful place. Welcome to your kingdom, lords. He thought he was talking to gods. These men who had so much power and who looked so differently than the, than the Aztecs. So he welcomed them into the city. 
and put them up in the finest quarters, beautiful palace. And the Spaniards were just in awe of all of the wonderful surroundings. They were given uh, many precious things as would, uh, was appropriate for honored guests. And after two or three months, apparently Montezuma approached Hernando Cortes and said, we've so much enjoyed having you here. When do you think you'll be leaving? Have you ever had guests like that? <laughs> Of course, we wouldn't be quite so, so uh, up front. Um, and Cortes responded by saying, We Spanish suffer from a disease of the heart, which can only be cured by gold. And it turns out that the place where the Spaniards were uh, living there was a plastered over section of the wall and one of the carpenters broke through into the treasury of Montezuma. Gold, wealth, beyond their imagination was in front of them. They were not going to be leaving anytime soon. Now, at about that point in time, something very unfortunate happened. Governor Velasquez, after he had not heard about what had happened to that expedition, sent, and of course, uh, Cortes had proceeded against his orders. He sent an expedition to arrest Cortes. And they arrived at approximately the same place where Cortes had sunk his ships. Word came over land that they had arrived. An army was there to arrest him. Cortes left 200 of the conquistadores in Mexico to protect the gold that they had discovered and set off for the coast with the remainder of his conquistadores. Now this Cortes was a very brilliant strategizer. He attacked them in the middle of the night and captured the leader of that group. And with that leader captured, the rest of the army surrendered. They surrendered very quickly when they found out that if they joined Cortes, they would be able to go back to Tenochtitlan with him and to share in the treasures that were awaiting them there. So that particular uh, threat to Cortes was uh, taken care of very, very quickly and his army was augmented significantly with the additional forces. They returned to Tenochtitlan to find disaster had happened in their absence. The individual who had been left to take care of things until Cortes returned, and a man by the name of Pedro de Alvarado, was as brutal as he was stupid. Apparently, there had been a religious ceremony in the city and he had felt like they were planning to attack and he killed hundreds of innocent Aztecs as they were participating in a religious ceremony. And so as Cortes and his army approached Tenochtitlan, they were approaching a city that had been outraged, that was ready to kill all of the Spaniards. What they did was they let Cortes and his army pass through into the center of the city where Alvarado and his men were located. And then they became besieged. They were surrounded by hostile Aztecs. Tens of thousands of men ready to take their lives. Well, as a, uh, a way of perhaps trying to deal with that situation, Cortes asked Montezuma to stand on the wall and pacify his people and try and get them to, to go home and, and leave the Spaniards in peace. By that time, the Aztecs had become so totally um, alienated from their king that they stoned him to death. At that point in time, the Spaniards' ace in the hole, Montezuma, was no longer available to them as a hostage they realized that in a very short period of time, they would be overwhelmed by this massive Aztec army that had them surrounded. 
So late one night, on June 30th of 1520, they decided they would break out. All of the men loaded up their pockets with all of the gold that they could carry, all of the treasures that they could carry, and they made a break for it. Now, Tenochtitlan was an island in the center of a lake connected with causeways to the mainland. Those causeways had breaks in the causeways period, uh, periodically in order, as a defensive measure. The Aztecs had bridges that they would put in place to enable passage, but they had removed those bridges. The Spaniards, realizing that that would be a problem, uh, a carpenter had built a bridge that was portable and they'd move it from one gap to the next gap and so forth and make their escape. They did it in the middle of the night, hoping not to be noticed. But a, uh, fishing, a, a woman who was fishing on one of the causeways raised the alarm and their bridge got stuck in one of the gaps. And so it was every man for himself. And that night, two-thirds of the conquistadores died 4,000 Indian allies as well. You can imagine, with their pockets loaded with gold, when they fell into the water, they went to the bottom. And so it was that most of the conquistadores and many of their, their Indian allies uh, died that night. La noche triste means the, the night of tragedy, the night of mourning or sadness. The... We, they, some of them reached the shore finally, and as they looked back, they saw something that totally horrified them. Sixty-two of their companions had been captured. And this is an eyewitness account of that particular occasion. The dismal drum of Huichi Lobos sounded again, accompanied by conches, horns, and trumpet-like instruments. It was a terrifying sound, and when we looked at the tall temple pyramid from which it came, we saw our comrades who had been captured being dragged up the steps to be sacrificed. Aztec priests laid them down on their backs on some narrow stones, and cutting open their chests, drew out their palpitating hearts, which they offered to the idols before them. What a horrible scene. Now, most men would have said, that's enough. I'm going back to Spain. I'm going to uh, retire from, from public life, and um, I will put all of this behind me. That was not Hernando Cortes. So what happened was Hernando Cortes retreated from Tenochtitlan back to Tlaxcala. And by the way, the Aztecs, if they had attacked them at that point in time, they would have decimated them. But they did not. And in Tlaxcala, he regrouped and sent many of the Indians back to the coast to recover, uh, sort of a, a recovery operation, a salvage operation, various things that would be needed to build a fleet that would sail on the lake. They built 13 ships. Tlaxcala was a long way from the lake, and so what they did was they built the ships, they numbered them so that they could be assembled on the shores of the lake. 13 ships versus 200,000 Aztec canoes. Again, the odds were just overwhelmingly against them. But over a period of three months, they finally succeeded in the defeat of the Aztecs. They destroyed the city of Tenochtitlan. The water ran red with their blood of the, of the Aztecs. 40,000 of them were killed, either by weapon or disease. Now, have any of you been to downtown Mexico City? Can I see a show of hands? A few people have. Well, you have been to Tenochtitlan. It's right in downtown Mexico City. This is the Zocalo, the main square next to the Palacio Nacional. By the way, over here is the museum, National Museum of, Arche of Anthropolo Anthropology, 
which is one of the, the greatest museums in the world. But there it is, right there, in downtown Mexico City. And in fact, this is what it looks like today. These are the ruins of the temple of Huitzilopochtli. Cortez was a bloodthirsty man. He wanted to destroy any opportunity for the remnants of the Triple Alliance, the Aztec Empire, from rising again. So he personally, with his own hands, killed Montezuma's successor, as well as the kings of the other two alliance kingdoms, Texcoco and Tlacopan. Sixty plus years of warfare followed. You can imagine. Of course, he wasn't there for all of it. But during the time that he was in Tenochtitlan, he traveled down as far as Trujillo in modern-day Honduras, as well as up to Baja California, and then down the coast. And this is where modern-day Acapulco is. So uh, later today or tomorrow, we will be sailing in the exact waters where Cortez sailed. He finally retired, went back to Spain, a wealthy and honored man, and died in his sleep. <clears throat> now, how was it that they were able to accomplish such an overwhelming defeat of a, an empire of 20 million people. First of all, it's important to realize that that empire consisted of subjugated peoples, conquered Indian nations and tribes, who had second-class citizenship, and they were looking for an opportunity to rebel against their conquerors. They had significant advantage in terms of the technologies available to them, the horses, the, the falconet, the, the armor, and so forth. Then there was the, the legend of Quetzalcoatl that gave them an advantage at a very crucial time because people believed that they were, were deities. Disease decimated the population. 40% of the population died from smallpox within the first decade. And within a century, only 5% of the uh, descendants of the tribes in the Aztec Empire lived. The, 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 the number of individuals had decreased so much because of the disease. And then, of course, the Spaniards' courage and luck and their brutality, all of that went together in creating this really remarkable tale of, of courage and brutality as well. So that is the end of our lecture today, and I believe I've got a lecture tomorrow on the Age of Discovery. So I hope that you'll, you'll come back and join us tomorrow, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of this day. Thank you.